I just started grabbing one, and so I was, or we'll just use one to cover this, right? They're 25 by 25, so I just didn't think it would be enough. Oh, I get you, okay, cool. Because these are like 40-ish feet. Oh, okay, yeah. You strap it where you want. I don't know if I need another metal thing here. Maybe not. Well, that's, yeah, if you can anchor it and then stretch it, then, then you should be able to, then it'll, it'll, it'll float higher. I guess like, oh, okay. For the last couple of years, I have been using the Florida weave method for my tomatoes. This year I'm doing that same thing again. I like it because it's inexpensive and it's easy for me to set up and take down. However, I do notice with the indeterminate tomatoes that just keep growing up and up, eventually everything gets heavy enough and the strings will start to slacken and then it all just sort of starts to sag. So this year I decided in addition to doing Florida weave, I'm gonna add some stakes for each tomato to help them stay straight up and down. Some of my tomatoes, in particular the Blue Beach, their natural way of growing is very viney. It's kind of floppy. <laughs> so I really think the stakes are gonna help for the time being, I just used tomato clips, but I'm gonna have to take those off, I think, because the stem of the tomato is gonna grow too big and it's not gonna be able to fit both of those there. So I'll probably switch that out for string, maybe. I'm not really sure. I'm just gonna keep an eye on it and just kind of play it by ear. That's how I work. <laughs> it looks like it's working really well so far. I need to purchase some more steaks and I'm hoping my local store has some of those. These are just ones that I've had for a lot of years. They're starting to break just some bamboo steaks that are like seven feet tall. Yeah, that's what I'm working on today. These are all from my garden. More than last year. Yeah, we didn't get very many cucumbers last year. No. That's why we didn't even make any pickles. Yep. Slice. Oh, yeah. I'll leave the other end. There, we are going to be canning some pickles today and the recipe I use comes from the book Foolproof Preserving and it's called Dill Pickle Chips. I really like this recipe a lot. It uses a low pasteurization method for making the pickles, so it makes them really crispy. And this is approved by the National Home Center of Food Preservation, so this is an okay method to use. And the other thing that I do for this recipe is instead of using the cider vinegar that it calls for, I sub out that ingredient for white vinegar. As long as you have the same acidity, you can switch out one type of vinegar for another. And then I also use a little bit less sugar and that is also something that is safe to adjust in a canning recipe. So that's what we're doing. Is that huh? It's according to the state of California. What else is on that list? <laughs> this is actually dill seed that I saved myself and I just keep reusing this jar. Ball makes this pickle crisp. This is calcium chloride. It makes your pickles crispier. I have done this recipe with and without this. It's pretty similar both ways. This ingredient is optional. So if you don't feel good about using that in your food, you don't have to. And a fully charged battery.
I sanitized my canning jars and I'm not sure if I need to or not for this recipe, but I did it just in case. There is a fairly new canning rule that says if you process anything for longer than 10 minutes, you do not need to sanitize your jars. Uh, this one you process for 30 minutes, but it's that, that low temperature, so hmm, I don't know. Uh, so I did it just in case. And the other thing is I'm canning. You'll notice I'm canning inside today. In a lot of my other videos, I can outside. I recently realized that my cooktops can have a canner on them as long as it's less than 50 pounds, which at full capacity, these are both less than 50 pounds. And it's 95 degrees outside today, so I do, I'm doing the canning inside, which is nice. The other thing I realized is that there's another switch to this recipe that I do and it tells you to put all of your spices like the mustard seeds and the dill into that brine that you heat up and I choose to put them separately individually into each jar just because I can measure out each of the spices and have them exact in each jar and I do that because those spices continue to give off flavors as time goes on and as those jars sit. And when you put them in the brine, it's really hard to get everything evenly between each jar. Oh, I got the brine, some extra brine right there. I'm hanging out at our orchard today and one of my biggest regrets about our land and what we did was the orchard and that is it is way away from our house and I wish I had put it closer but it was like the first thing that we planted here and originally our house was going to be in a different location so the orchard is not moving the only thing that may move is I may plant a couple of trees up closer to our house but for now this works and the other negative about having the orchard way away from the house is that I don't check up on it as often and also there is no water down here. So I'm going to be watering some of this today because we still have not gotten any rain and we're going on maybe four or five weeks now of no rain which is super unusual for us here in Arkansas. And my trees are starting to yellow a little bit on the bottom so I've got to take care of those. While I was sitting here checking up on my trees, I noticed some bagworms on here. So I'm just going to pick those off and put them in a bucket while I wait for everything to get watered. I'll check all the trees. It'll give me something to do. So the fun never ends with gardening. Just always keeps you on your toes. I was out here just yesterday and I noticed that my potatoes look like they were getting eaten by something. And we have never had potato bugs here in the past. I thought, well, maybe it's potato bugs and we're actually getting them this year. I looked down at my plants and there were no potato bugs, but they were covered with beetles. And I had to go and look in my book to discover what kind of beetle this was. And it's called the striped blister beetle. So I grabbed a bucket of water, I put some soap in it and 
went through all of the plants and tried to shake them off into that bucket of water. I got a ton of beetles off and I'm doing that again today. I'm probably gonna be doing that until the potatoes are done for the year. They did a pretty significant amount of damage already, but luckily the damage is foliar and not below ground. So the potatoes underground, I'm hoping, are still good. You know, even if they killed off the plants, we would still get potatoes, just not as many. So I'm gonna be doing that every single day from here on out just to keep populations low because if they were to kill off all of the potatoes, then they would just move to another crop, probably my tomatoes because they're in the same family. I learned that last year with the harlequin bugs that as soon as you see a bad bug, you need to try and eradicate it immediately. So that's what we're trying to do. I've been spending probably three to four hours a day trying to pick off the blister beetles. I didn't realize how many I missed because when you shake them off, their natural uh, thing is to drop to the ground and over by the potatoes, we have a lot of hay down so you can't see them. So that next night, they basically defoliated a whole bunch of the plants. And then the next morning, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. There's so much damage in just like a really short amount of time. And so that next night, I went out at night and I got all of the beetles that I could and it looks like the potatoes are looking better. I feel like I got a lot of them off of there, maybe the majority, but now I'm finding that there are blister beetles on my Brussels sprouts and they're defoliating those and they're on my tomatoes now. <laughs> this is a way worse problem than the tomato drainage thing. I didn't realize it could get worse, but it has gotten worse. Oh, it's so frustrating. <sighs> Homesteading is not for the faint of heart. I'm outside and I'm gonna be putting buckets and um, plant containers on my Brussels sprouts because they're gonna get eaten overnight if I just leave them as is. So I'm trying to protect them from the blister beetles. So this is how they defoliate the plant so much. They just all swarm together. These are my peppers. I knew they were gonna get here sometime. I'm glad I checked. I'm trying to get those off. I have spent so much time the last couple of days trying to remove pests from the garden that I'm way behind on other things like weeding and preserving. I'm trying to get caught up today, but I did wanna give you guys an update on the blister beetle situation <laughs> so two days ago was when i the beetles were so bad they were just all they had this is when they had spread to all over my garden they were on my brussels sprouts and my tomatoes and my peppers and i just couldn't catch them all i spent from nine o'clock at night to midnight trying to shake them off into buckets and it was really difficult to get the low-lying plants into a bucket so I had to hand pick the beetles off of there and then the tomatoes are so bushy that it was hard to get them in there and I came inside I was exhausted from everything just like mentally exhausted I was physically exhausted from like constantly like bending over and trying to get them off and I started to cry and was just really frustrated and Cameron was like we just need to pray because you have done everything that you can that you could in your power to get those off but you we need to ask for help for God to do the rest and so we prayed that night and I came out so I came out the next day and there were no beetles like anywhere on the side of my garden and I saw this frog there and I was like wow like I think this frog is eating all of my beetles then on the other side of the garden I, I was checking and checking. I was like, there's no way that they could have just like disappeared. They have to have moved. 
And so I found them on my potatoes. They had just all clustered there. It allowed me to be able to get them all off all at once as opposed to being scattered everywhere. So I took this, I did the same process. I took my bucket filled with water and soap and the potatoes are just way easier to get the beetles off of because they, um, just the nature of the plants, I can shake them off into the bucket. And so I probably took off maybe 5,000 beetles and I'm, that's no exaggeration. There were so many on these plants. On This was an area of potatoes that hadn't been eaten yet. Seeing them all in one spot like that, like they didn't just disappear like I wanted them to, but they all clustered in one spot so that I could get rid of the majority of them. And to me, that was a complete miracle. An answer to prayer and just what I needed to move on. I'm pretty sure that is gonna be the end of our problem. I'm hoping that this is pretty much it, unless they're coming more from the fields and being coming into our garden. Like I know I've gotten 95% of them out of my garden, which is a miracle. seen a spider that big before. Where is it? It's got little babies on it. It's got babies on it? I'm just kidding. Yep. Nuh-uh. Hold on. It's right here, Kim. And Chris is putting- No, it. there's no babies on it. Whoa. You guys are too close. It's just gonna like attack your face. So no, scared. it's not. It's not gonna leap up. It's not a jumping spider. Ah. 